In our previous video, we learned how to... What did we learn? We learned how to do an ANOVA and then follow that ANOVA up if we had strong evidence against the null hypothesis using Fisher confidence intervals. But there are problems with Fisher confidence intervals in that each interval contains 90, has 95% confidence of containing the true difference. Because each interval has 95% confidence, that means the more intervals we do, the worse and worse our type 1 error gets. So this uh, video is about Tukey's method. So we want to control our overall confidence level, which means we are going to also control our overall type 1 error. For 95% confidence intervals, the confidence level of 0.95 indicates the long run probability that a single interval will contain the true value of the parameter of interest. That is, if we build one interval, there's one parameter of interest, such as the true mean difference mu1 minus mu2. For tests with alpha of 0.05, the significance level of 0.05 is the probability that any single hypothesis test will re result in a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true. That is, if there really is no difference between mu1 and mu2, that is, if the two means are the same, the probability that our test would result in our claiming that there is a difference is only going to be 0.05 or 5%. So that is, we'd find a difference 5% of the time when really there isn't. We want a confidence level that applies to an entire family of intervals or an entire family of tests. And we want that probability that all confidence intervals will contain the true difference in means or the true differences in means. But because we're going to be doing these multiple tests or these multiple intervals, that means there are multiple effects of interest. That means we're going to be looking at the effect or the difference between mu1 and mu2, but also the difference mu1 and mu3 and say mu2 and mu3. And if there are more groups, say a group 4 and a group 5, that means more and more and more effects of interest, meaning more and more and more tests. And every time we do a comparison, this comparison will have a type 1 error, this comparison will have a type 1 error, this comparison will have a type 1 error. So every test we do has its own type 1 error. And the more tests we do, the probability that we commit at least one type 1 error goes up. So when we have multiple intervals, this provides one possible example of the multiple testing problem that we read about at the beginning of the semester. For the 95% intervals calculated above, such as the interval for the difference between mu1 and mu2, the interval uh, for the difference between mu1 and mu3, the interval between mu2 and mu3, would the overall confidence level be greater than or less than 95%? In this case, the overall confidence level would be less than 95% because each interval has a possibility of a type 1 error. The probability that we have at least one type 1 error goes up, therefore the overall confidence level must go down, and so that overall confidence level is going to be less than 95%, even if each 95% confidence interval, even if each interval itself has 95% confidence. If we wanted to correct the intervals to give an overall confidence level of 95%, would the new intervals have to be wider or narrower? The new intervals would have to be wider. We need each inter individual interval, excuse me, we need each individual interval to have greater than 95% confidence in order to have all intervals together or that overall confidence level to be 95%. So if we conduct multiple tests, is the true type 1 error rate going to be greater than or less than 5%? Well, we've already answered this. The true type 1 error rate is going to be greater than 5%. The probability of at least one type 1 error is greater than 
probability of the type 1 error for a single test. So when we do multiple tests, the probability of at least one type 1 error for all of those tests is greater than the probability of a type 1 error for any single one of those tests. So how do we fix this? We use something called Tukey's method. So notice that this is Tukey. So that's T-U-K-E-Y. So Tukey is a famous statistician. He's a very big name in statistics generally, but in regression specifically. But it is Tukey. Tukey, not Turkey. So do not call them Turkey intervals, however close it looks. So this is a Tukey's method for controlling our type 1 error rate or our overall confidence level. So we have something that looks like what we saw in our previous video. We still have order differences reports. So at the top we have our biggest effect for this is the difference between the mean decrease in, the, sorry, the difference in the mean decrease in diets uh, in BMI for different diets. And here we have the smallest effect. So this is the smallest difference in the decrease in uh, BMIs. And so we have the same differences. So these are the same effect sizes. So these are the same effects that we saw before. And these are the same standard errors that we saw in our previous videos. But we can see that the confidence intervals have changed. The confidence intervals are each wider than the one we saw. Uh, in our previous vid video. That's because Tukey accounts for that extra variability that we need or that extra width that we need so that this entire set of seven confidence intervals, sorry, six confidence intervals to have a total confidence of 95% across all six instead of uh, when all is said and done so that the total type 1 error rate for all six intervals is no more than 5%. So when we look at all six of these intervals, we can say we are 95% confident that all these intervals, or excuse me, in all these intervals. So the entire set of all of these intervals together have 95% confidence. It is not any one of them. So if you remember how we interpreted our confidence intervals for Fisher, each interval had 95% confidence. With Tukey, the entire set of intervals have 95% confidence. So the type 1 error rate for Zone versus Atkins is actually less than 5%. Similarly, the type 1 error rate for Learn versus Atkins is less than 5%. And we can see, if you remember, our confidence interval for Fisher, the Fisher confidence interval for Zone versus Atkins was 0.04 to 1.4. It's a much wider interval when we use the Tukey correction because this actually has a wider interval. This is a less than 5% error rate, meaning it has higher confidence. And we know that higher confidence has, uh, gives us wider intervals. But when we take that higher confidence for all six intervals, that means that when all is said and done, we're going to have no worse than 95% confidence for all six of these intervals together. So how do I get these? How can I get my two key intervals and how can I get my Fisher intervals in jump? I did not show you this last time because I knew this was going to be a shorter video. Well, in jump, I'm going to do this using my beer goggles data. So this is data that we saw before. So I've already run my one-way ANOVA, and here it's appropriate to follow up using a Tukey or a Fisher analysis because we have a large F ratio and a small p-value. So it's okay to try to figure out where that group difference lays. So I go up to my red arrow menu for my analysis, and what I want to do is I want to compare my means. So I compare my means one of two ways. I can compare each pair using students T, or I can compare all pairs using Tukey's HSD. And what the language in JUMP is doing is telling us where that confidence level 
or alternatively where that type 1 error rate is applying. Remember, Fisher says each pair comparison is getting 95% confidence. So each pairwise confidence interval has 95% applied to it. Two keys controls the confidence level for all possible pairs. So all pairs, when they are compared, have a total confidence of 95%. Each pair, so each confidence level of two key, when we do two keys intervals, has higher than 95% confidence. So let's do each pairs, or each pair, so let's do our Fisher's confidence intervals and then compare them to two keys. So I get my order differences reports down here and we can see that when people have two pints of beer versus four pints of beer, that gives us the largest effect of 18 points on the attractiveness scale. The standard error for the difference is 3.95 and the lower and upper bound for our 95% confidence interval is 10 points up to 26 points. This is a pretty large effect. If we were measuring things on, I believe, a 100 point scale, then we're seeing a pretty noticeable difference for people who have two versus four pints. For people who have zero pints versus four pints, the effect is 17, so it's nearly the same size effect. And the confidence interval goes from nine to 25, so a pretty similar interval. However, for people who have two pints versus no beer, so two pints versus zero pints of lager, the effect is only about 0.9, so not even a one point difference in the perceived attractiveness. And the confidence interval, unsurprisingly, is basically centered at zero. It goes from negative seven to about nine. So this is a very small effect. It's centered about, it's at about zero, and the confidence interval goes from negative seven to eight, so there's basically no effect, or there's weak evidence, very weak evidence for any effect in the difference between two and zero pints. But there's pretty strong evidence for a difference for those who drink zero and four pints and those who drink two versus four pints. So four pints seems to be where the difference lies. So if you drink four pints, you're gonna perceive people to be differently attractive than if you have no beer at all. And if you drink four pints, you're gonna perceive people as differently attractive than if you even have just two pints of beer. Each one of these intervals has 95% confidence. So each one of these intervals also is built with a 5% error rate. So every time we do one of these comparisons, we're making a 5%, there's a 5% chance that we make an error. If we want to do better than that, if we want to control so that when we've looked at all three of these comparisons, there's only a total 5% chance of making an error, we use Tukey. So we come back up here, we look at our red arrow menu, and we come down to comparing means, and we do all pairs Tukey. We scroll back to the bottom and we look at our order difference report. We see again the same order differences because our effect sizes are not changed. So this is just the difference in our sample means for two versus four pints, zero versus four, and two versus zero. The standard errors are unchanged, but what is different is the size or the width of our confidence interval. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you have two versus four pints, two key estimates that the effect can be as small as eight and a half points and as large as 27.7 points. If you have zero versus four pints of alcohol, the perceived attractiveness per two key is estimated to be as small as 7.6 uh, points and as large as 26.8 points. And if you have two versus zero pints of alcohol, Tukey estimates the true mean difference to be in perceived attractiveness to be as low as 8.7 and as large as 10.5. So in this case, our uh, decisions are not widely affected, but we can see that there is a difference in the size of the effects. So I'm gonna collapse some of this output so we can compare Tukey versus uh, uh, Fisher. So the effect sizes are the same. So we can see the difference columns are the same. The standard errors are the same because those are just based on the sample data. The only thing that's affected is our critical value. That's what makes it wider. So our lower bounds are lower for Tukey and our upper bounds are higher for Tukey, giving us a wider confidence interval. 
So these three intervals for Tukey, these lower three intervals for Tukey, this all together has 95% confidence. Each interval for Fisher, each has 95% confidence. And I'll, this bears repeating, we cannot do either. It is not appropriate to do either Tukey or Fisher if the overall ANOVA does not give us strong evidence. So if we have a weak effect, if we have weak evidence against that null hypothesis, then we shouldn't do a follow-up analysis. We should only do a follow-up analysis if evidence indicates at least one of our means is different. Because what we're doing with these confidence intervals is looking to find out which mean is different. So that's it for our follow-up analysis. Our next video is going to be about two-way ANOVA, which is section 14.3 in the book.